Daybreak is almost here. It's nearly Sunday. Seven hundred years ago, a man named Isaiah wrote that the Messiah would come to Israel and be rejected and killed. Four hundred years ago, God stopped sending prophets. Thirty-three years ago, God broke his silence and an army of angels announced the birth of the Savior. Three and a half years ago, John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Three years ago, Jesus told Nicodemus that the Son of Man must be lifted up and that those who believe in him will have eternal life. One year ago, Jesus told his followers he would be killed by the Jewish leaders, but that he would rise again after three days. Last Sunday, Jesus rode into Jerusalem as the people shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Thursday night, Jesus was betrayed by one of his own and arrested. On Friday, the crowd shouted, Crucify! And the sinless Son of God was killed on a Roman cross. Jesus' disciples have been in hiding, terrified for their lives, not understanding what has happened. It's been a long two nights, but in a few seconds, the sun will rise. Good morning, and welcome to Covenant Community Fellowship's online Easter service this morning. If you're a regular attender at Covenant Community Fellowship, or if you're here for the first time at the invitation of a friend or a family member, or if you just happen to stumble onto our, our live stream this morning, we are glad that you're here because we, this is going to be a significant service for all of us this morning. Significant in the sense that this is a way, a day of celebration. You see, 2,000 years ago, it was Jesus Christ who they crucified. Jesus Christ, who they then took down from the, the cross and they placed him in a tomb and they rolled a big boulder in front, thinking no more would they be hearing from Jesus at all. But then on this morning, Easter morning, Sunday morning, Jesus raised from the dead. And upon his raising from the dead, he defeated sin and he defeated death. And about that boulder thing that was in front of the tomb, Jesus didn't need the boulder to be moved away so he could walk out of the tomb. Jesus came right through the stone. But the boulder was removed so that you and I, those witnesses, could see that Jesus was no longer there. You see, Jesus was alive. And so for the church, we celebrate this day with some of those words of greeting with each other as we come into contact with each other as we worship together on this particular Easter morning. We say words of encouragement and words of victory, like he is risen and he's risen indeed. Yes, you see, Jesus is alive. My name is Pastor Jay Moyer and on behalf of the leadership team at Covenant, we wanna wish you a happy Easter today. Please understand that this kind of arrangement, this service kind setup is not our preference. Our preference would be that we would join together at the sanctuary, at the house of worship, that we would all be together to raise our voices, to join together in praise and hallelujah this Easter. However, because of the restrictions that are on us, we're committed to praising and worshiping our risen Savior through the internet. 
but we all need to understand this additional fact, that the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit far exceeds any limits that we might incur on behalf of the internet. Know that he is with us even while we are apart like this, as we join together in our separation, he is with us. And he is also there with you in the confinement of your own home. Since we're separated like you are, I would like to invite all of us to actually participate now in the worship service. I would invite you to go to the comment section at the bottom of this stream and type in the words of greeting like, hi, I'm here, hi, I'm glad you're, we're all together, or even words like, he is risen, he is risen indeed. I'm not sure how you found out about us, but we're glad that you're here this morning if you're a first time visitor. If you're comfortable typing in in a comment saying, hey, this is Jay or John or Phil or Sarah, if you're comfortable doing that in the comments, please do that. If you're not, I would invite you to send us an email at the church address and let us know that you were worshiping with us on Easter Sunday and help us get to know who you are and that we might greet you in return. It seems like a long time since we have been together. When is the last time that we were able to extend a hand for a handshake and receive one offered in return? When is the last time that we've been able to say hi to each other without the barrier of a face mask between us? And if you're like me, the significance of a hug is real. And so when's the last time that we were actually able to provide or give a gentle hug of greeting? It's been a long time. And because of that, that disconnect, that real disconnect that you and I both feel, we all feel, we thought it would be a nice idea and a pleasant surprise to provide you with a greeting from a few familiar faces that might help encourage your day on this resurrection morning and lighten our time together. What a season to remember that Jesus is our only hope. The resurrected King is resurrecting us with peace and joy and hope in this season. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. He is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hi Covenant family, it's the Longs here. Wishing you all a wonderful Easter. Pray that it's a special day for you and your family as you celebrate together and look forward to getting back together with you Sunday morning very soon. Love you all. Bye. Hi, it's Dale and Ruth Landis. We want to wish everyone a happy Easter. He is risen indeed. Happy Easter, everyone, to all our friends and family. He is risen. He is risen. risen indeed. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. <laughs>
Resurrection Day on Easter. Our next song is about standing in the love of the Lord and how he's redeemed us and set us up to be able to stand in front of him despite all of our brokenness, pain, and darkness that's around us in these um, uncertain times that we're in right now. So I invite you to join us in Stand in Your Love. Darkness tries to roll over my bones
So I've got good news and I've got bad news. You know, I always dread when people say that to me. I don't know about you, but I found that when people say they've got good news and bad news, what they're really saying is they've just got bad news. And they're trying to soften it and make it a little bit easier somehow, add a silver lining to it. A few years ago, I took my car into the shop because the check engine light was on. And the mechanic looked at it and he called me up and... He said, well, I've got good news and bad news for you. And I'm like, okay. He's like, the good news is there's nothing wrong with your engine. I'm going, oh, that's, that is good. Um, maybe I can get out of this without having to pay too much money. Then he said, the bad news is I have to replace two of your oxygen sensors, which is going to cost you $600 a piece for $1,200 total. I'm going, that's not good news at all. That, that's a ton of money. There, there's no good news in this. I appreciate him trying to soften it a little bit, but it was still bad news. Maybe you've experienced similar things before. But you know, what I think most of us want right now is just good news. We just want to know that there's still goodness in the world. Just hear the good things that are happening. And we actually have people that are trying to step up to the plate with that. Guys like the actor John Krasinski. I don't know if you know him, but he was famous for playing Jim on the TV show The Office. A little over a week ago, he started a brand new YouTube channel called the SGN Network, which stands for Some Good News Network. And he started putting out videos that were dedicated to just sharing good things and good news that was happening around the world. And people were so hungry for this that his first video got over 1 million views in under 24 hours. It rose to number two on YouTube's trending list. That's how much people desired good news. Well, I'm no John Krasinski, not nearly as talented as he is, but I do have some good news for you this morning. And I'd like to share that. And to do that, we're going to turn in our Bibles the book of Luke chapter 24. Luke chapter 24. If you have a Bible, I encourage you to, to grab it, pull it out. If you need to go to another room and get it, take a minute and do that. You can pull it up on your phone. If you've never looked in a Bible before, here's a trick. You can just Google Luke 24. I'm pretty sure the first link you get will be the passage we're going to look at today. So you can find that as well to follow along with us. This is Luke chapter 24. Now, the Gospel of Luke, this book that we're looking in, is simply Luke's telling of the life of Jesus, of who he was, of what he did, and of why it mattered. 
And up to this point, we've gotten to the place in the story where Jesus has been tried, arrested, arrested and then tried, and then convicted as a criminal and as a traitor to the Roman Empire, sentenced to death by crucifixion. And on Friday of this week, he is crucified and killed. Given His body is given to a man named Joseph of Arimathea, who puts his body in a tomb. And then we get to Saturday. And Saturday is a day of no good news at all. Saturday was the Sabbath, the day that the Jewish people observed where they were supposed to do nothing and just rest. So everybody was staying home, kind of like we are right now. But especially the disciples, the followers of Jesus, were following their own shelter-in-place order. Not because they were afraid of a virus, but because they were afraid that the Roman soldiers who crucified Jesus were coming for them next. Because often when a traitor was crucified, his followers and his friends were then tried and convicted as well, and also killed. So the disciples are hiding out on Saturday. And then we get to Sunday. And this is what it says in Luke chapter 24, starting in verse 1, about Sunday. It says, On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. So you have this small group of women who had been with Jesus throughout his entire ministry. They had followed him. They had served with him. They had learned from him. They were there when he was crucified and they saw where Joseph had laid his body in his tomb. And they had prepared spices, which was a common practice in the ancient world, to help preserve a body as it began to decompose. Normally this happened right after someone was killed. But because they didn't go on the Sabbath, they decided to go the next day to bring these spices. Now, we don't know whether they were going because they thought the men who had buried Jesus hadn't wrapped his body in spices, or because they thought that they had. But whatever the reason was, they were going to do this job and they were going to do it right. And something remarkable happens when they get to the tomb of Jesus. It says in verses 2 and 3, They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. So there was this massive stone that was customary to put in front of tombs. These stones would weigh between one and two tons, two to four thousand pounds. They were huge. It would take a large group of men to roll the stone in front of the tomb. And then when the women get there, it had already been rolled away. This wasn't totally unheard of. There were such things as grave robbers and people who would try and steal bodies. But it was really remarkable at this point because it was only two days after Jesus had died. There wasn't much time for this to happen. And so they start to wonder what's going on here. The, t- the stone has been rolled away and Jesus' body isn't in the tomb. Where is it? And then it says going on in verse 4. While they were wondering about this, Suddenly, two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Remember how he told you, while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. So as the women are wondering about what happened to the body of Jesus, two men in robes that it says gleamed like lightning. Now I have no idea what that actually looks like, but I can imagine it was very bright and very scary. And these men are obviously angels. And when the women see them, they do what everybody else in the Bible does when they see an angel. They hit the floor. I mean, they're just down because they're so terrified by the sight of these powerful beings. And the angels begin by asking them a question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? This is an interesting question. Essentially, they're saying, why are you looking for someone who's alive in a grave? It would be like us saying, you know, why are you putting or why are you, you know, placing that live person in a casket? That doesn't make any sense. And the angels go on to explain what they mean by this question. In verse 6, it says, he is not here He has risen. 
This was the ultimate good news. This was the best news that these women could have ever gotten. The idea that Jesus is risen. And th this was an earth-shattering declaration. Something that would just have blown their minds. You know, sometimes we, we think about the ancient world and we say, well, those people were superstitious and they were, you know, very into supernatural things. So it was easier for them to believe that someone had risen from the dead than us, right? With our modern science and our modern medicine. Let's be very clear about something. It did not take modern science and modern medicine for people to learn that dead people don't rise from the dead, they, people have known this for thousands and thousands of years. Yeah, you have stories about gods and supernatural beings kind of, kind of doing that, but a normal person rising from the dead simply does not happen. And yet that's what the angels say happened here. This would have been so confusing for the women. So fortunately, the angels decide to give some explanation to this. They say, remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee? The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day be raised again. Then they remembered his words. The angels remind them that Jesus said this is what was going to happen. And this is the moment that the light bulb goes on for these women. They say, he did say that. Now everything he had taught us starts to make sense. I can imagine just this, this whirlwind of emotions and these changes that, that they've been seeing from coming to the tomb in, in sorrow to the confusion of not finding Jesus' body there to the surprise at the appearance of angels to the absolute joy of hearing that Jesus is alive. Because this is the best news they could have ever gotten. It's the best news anybody ever has gotten. Now, what do you do when you hear good news? Well, if you're like most of us, you want to share it, right? Good news is meant to be shared. You can't keep good news to yourself. I remember when my daughter Meredith was born a little over a year ago, sitting and, and holding her in one arm and, and trying to text my family in the other arm, like, she's here, she's here, just not even waiting until Val got out of, you know, the, the C-section operating room, just having to tell everybody right away. You want to share good news. Maybe you've had that experience. Or you've had a son or a daughter get into the college that they wanted. Maybe you have gotten your first job or a new job or a dream job that you've always desired. And you just got to tell everybody about it. Maybe you found out you were going to be grandparents for the first time. Whenever good news happens, we want to share it. And that's exactly what the women do says this in verses 9 and 10. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. So the women return to where the disciples are hiding out and they share what happened. Angels have told us Jesus is risen and his body wasn't there. They shared this incredible good news. And this good news that we're talking about reflects a fundamental part of our faith, of what it means to be a Christian. Because Im imagine for a second, if I were to go out on the street and ask a bunch of random people, what, what do you think Christianity is all about? What, what do you think they would say? I'm guessing I'd probably get some, some different answers. Some people would, would not like Christianity and probably not want to answer the question. But for those who had a positive view of Christianity... They might say, well, you know, Christianity is, it's a, an ethical system, right? It's designed to help us treat others better. Or, or, or it gives us moral instructions on how to live better lives and, and how, to, how to live as better people. Or, or maybe Christianity is about becoming more spiritual, getting us closer to God and what, what I have to do to make that happen. I think those would be some common responses. And I think it's common because, listen, most religions, that's what they are. They're ethical systems or, or moral systems or spiritual systems that are all designed to help us become better people and connect with God. 
They provide good advice. And maybe if you follow this advice well enough, you'll get to heaven or paradise or nirvana or or whatever the final destination is. But here's the important part. That's not what Christianity is all about. Christianity is not an ethical system or a moral system or a religious system. It's not based on a, a neat philosophy or a religious understanding. Christianity fundamentally is based on a single universe-changing event. And that's this event, the resurrection. In other words, let me put it like this. Christianity isn't good advice. It's good news. Christianity isn't good advice. It's good news. See, for those of us who are Christians... The point of this is not about finding ways to have better marriages or raise moral kids or find inner peace or have a a deeper sense of spirituality. It's not about having mystical experiences or growing up to be a better person. And this book, the Bible, isn't some sort of ancient book of, of religious or spiritual life hacks to make our short stay on this planet a little bit better and then give us, you know, a key to whatever is nicer up in the sky. That's not the point of all of this. Christianity at its core is the staggering declaration that Jesus, who lived and taught and died, also rose again. And in rising from the dead, he defeated sin and death once and for all. Everything begins there and everything flows from this reality, from this good news. The things that we usually talk about on our Sunday services, forgiveness and restored relationships, new community, hope and peace are all products of this resurrection, this good news. See, the problem is, so often we don't talk about Christianity as good news. We talk about it as good advice. We tell people what they need to do instead of what God has done. We focus on avoiding bad things instead of living into this resurrection reality that we've been given. In fact, the word that we use to talk about our faith is the word gospel which comes from a very old world word called euangelion, which means good news. This good news that Jesus has risen from the dead and he offers us new life too. Now listen, I know some of you are, are watching this this morning and church isn't your thing. You don't normally go to church. Maybe you go periodically through, you know, in the year once or twice or three times, but for whatever reason you're watching this morning, and that could be for a number of reasons. It could be because you think it's the right thing to do. Maybe it's your tradition. Maybe you got roped into it from your, by your family. Maybe you're watching this morning because you're looking for some hope in the midst of a really difficult time. Whatever the reason is, I'm glad that you're watching. I'm glad that you're interested in in what the Bible has to say at some level. But if you're watching this morning, maybe you don't buy into the whole good news thing. And there's two reasons that you might not, and I would understand both of these reasons. Maybe, first of all, you don't actually think it's news. Maybe you think it's fake news, that it didn't really happen. And that's fine. I I get that. I've been a skeptic at times in my life. See, a lot of people look at the story of the resurrection and they say, oh, it's it's a great story, right? It's a metaphor for new life and new possibilities. You know what spring is all about. Or, Or it's an inspirational story to help us keep going in the midst of failure. Or it's a reminder of hope in the face of death. And who doesn't need some hope in the face of death right now? While all these are well-intentioned, they all seem to deny the idea of a literal resurrection, that Jesus actually rose from the dead. And I got to tell you, these are nice thoughts, but they're all wrong. This resurrection story isn't about 
having us feel more inspired or motivated or to give us just some sort of generalized hope. It is the foundation of Christianity. And that foundation is a historical claim that Jesus lived, died, and most importantly, rose again from the grave. Like physically, bodily. I can't be too clear about this because it's so easy to try and make this a symbolic thing or a metaphorical thing. But what we're claiming as Christians is that Jesus literally died and literally rose again. Again, I can understand if you're a skeptic. I know there's lots of objections out there. And we don't have time to go through all the evidence and all the arguments right now. It would take us hours. But I'm asking you to kind of trust me here. That this is the only answer. The physical resurrection of Jesus is the only answer that makes any historical sense of what actually happened 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem. And it makes the only sense of what happened for the 2,000 years th since that date. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the author, English author, put a great line in the, in the mouth of his greatest detective hero, Sherlock Holmes. Or Sherlock says this, Once you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. I'm here to tell you that the resurrection is the truth. That it really happened. So, okay, may maybe you're okay with the news part of it, but, but maybe you have an issue with the good part of it. Because what's really good about this news? I mean, uh, okay, I'll give you Jesus rose from the dead, but how has that been good? In fact, if you look at all of the, the terrible things that Christians have done over the centuries and millennia, surely it hasn't been good for anyone. And I can understand that argument too. And yeah, there have been plenty of times where us Christians have failed to follow well in the footsteps of Jesus. But there have been vastly more times where the life that Jesus has given us to bring to the world has resulted in so many good things. Hope and healing and forgiveness and rescue and life transformation. And I can tell you all about the historical examples, but the most important one to me is to see what Jesus has done in my life to know who I would be otherwise if I didn't have this resurrection power living in me, to know how angry I'd be, to know how quickly I would harm the people I love most in my life, destroy the relationships that matter most. I know exactly who I'd be without Jesus and who I am now is so much better it's truly good, not because of anything I've done, but only because of Jesus. So listen, if you're watching this and church isn't your thing and Christianity is just another religion, I just want to let you know I've got good news for you. Jesus rose from the dead and he transforms all of those who follow him. He's really alive. And even if you're skeptical, understand that the disciples themselves were skeptical. In fact, it says here, verse 11, But they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. All the initial followers of Jesus, when they first heard the good news, didn't believe. And yet all of them would come to the place where they believed so significantly that they would give their lives for this. Listen, Jesus is alive. He wants to give you his life, his resurrection power, his transforming presence in your life. And all you have to do is just ask him for it. Because look, if Jesus really did rise from the dead, if this really happened, the only logical response, I mean, you can just think about this. The only logical response is to give your life to him. It's the only thing that makes sense. I encourage you to do that today. All you have to do is begin by praying a prayer that says, Jesus, I believe you lived and died and rose again. And Lord, I want to give my life to you. Forgive me of my sins and give me your resurrection power. And when you do that, you can have a new start and a new life with Jesus. Now, 
for us Christians, those who are followers of Jesus, this is important for us because we need to recenter the resurrection in our faith. It's too easy. It's it, too often. We've gotten away from this, this news, the resurrection that Jesus has died and rose again. We've gotten into other things. And, and there's two major issues that we need to deal with today, right now. Number one is that too often we've shared good advice instead of good news. When talking about our faith, we've talked about what people are supposed to do instead of what God has done through Jesus. We end up setting up barriers to other people, moral systems that we ourselves can't even live up to. We end up showing ourselves to be hypocrites. See, we need to focus on the news that Jesus died and he rose again, that he is risen. That's where the heart of our faith is. Any advice, any instructions come well after that, that reality of our living Savior and Lord Jesus. That's the first issue. The second issue that we have that we really have to deal with this morning as followers of Jesus is the fact that too often we've made good news feel like old news. Oh, and this just kills me. Too often we, we've made this amazing, earth-shattering news feel like old hat. It's another Easter. Yeah, you know, Jesus is risen. That's, that's great. It doesn't excite us anymore. It doesn't drive the passion of our lives anymore. We spend our Easter morning looking forward to our social distancing Easter egg hunt, however, however that works, instead of rejoicing and celebrating what Jesus has done in his resurrection. See, I think it's time for us to get excited about the resurrection again to respond to this reality as if it actually is good news, the best news ever. Maybe to respond like this. This is what they felt like when it happened. And today, it's how we should feel too. Because what it meant for them, it means for us. I've got good news. Even though coronavirus is rampaging around the world as we speak, Jesus is still risen. Even as we are all facing economic uncertainties and challenges that none of us could have even imagined just a few weeks ago, Jesus is still risen. Even as many of us are dealing with isolation and loneliness that comes from being quarantined, Jesus is still risen. And as we prepare to face difficulties that none of us are really ready for, Jesus is still risen. That is the good news that overcomes all other news. Listen, if you're watching this, and you have never given your life to Jesus, I want to tell you today is your day. 
this is the day, this is the day I've been praying for you about, that you would hear this good news and accept it, and accept the incredible gift that Jesus offers. That if you just give him your life, he'll give you his resurrection life in return. And replace fear and shame and doubt with forgiveness and life and hope and love. And so if you've never made that decision, I want to encourage you to do that today, this day. Don't miss this opportunity to accept the good news, the new reality that Jesus has risen again and defeated sin and death once and for all. He so wants you to experience that, and I so want you to experience that too. If you do make that decision today, or if you just want to talk about it, I encourage you to get in contact with us at the church through our website. We would love to talk with you and we will talk with you right away. But don't miss this chance. Today is your day. For those of you who are followers of Jesus, I do have a challenge for you today. You know that greeting that Jay had mentioned earlier in the service where one person says he is risen and the other person replies he is risen indeed. I'm sure many of you are using that today, but normally we only use that on Easter. And I think we need to extend that to remind ourselves that the resurrection is not just an Easter reality, it's a forever reality. So my challenge is for the next seven days, I want to encourage you to begin your conversations at least once a day with that greeting. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Whether you're calling someone on the phone or, or texting them or sitting down to dinner with your family, I know we're all limited in who we can talk to right now, so just do the best you can. But start this way so that we can remind each other that this isn't good advice. And it's not old news. It is good news as much today as it ever has been. And as we face the challenges ahead, we can rest on that foundation that we serve a living Savior and Lord. Now that is some good news. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you are alive, that this was not a metaphor or a symbol or just a nice inspiring story, but you physically rose from the grave, that you have defeated sin and death, that you offer everyone new life and resurrection power. Lord, I pray for those who have never accepted this, that they would make that decision today they would make this most important choice to trade their life for the new life that you offer them. And Father, I pray for all of us who are followers of you that you would not let us forget that we are resurrection people, especially as we face the difficulties and challenges ahead. Let us rest in the knowledge that you are alive and no news will ever surpass that. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Thank you again for joining us for our special online Easter service. We're so glad that you decided to be with us this morning. We pray that you and your family would have a wonderful celebration today, that you would all stay healthy and safe as you're kind of sheltering in place as we all are. And if you're not connected with us here at Covenant, we'd encourage you to do that, to get connected a little bit more. And the easiest way to do that is to click the link that's in this stream that will take you to our website contact page. Just give us your name. Let us know what you thought about the service. Let us know where you're watching from. If you have any needs at all, we would love to help you with that. We certainly want to help you get more connected to us as, as we go forward and eventually as we open back up the church and have more events. So please do that. But to all of you, we just, on behalf of Covenant Community Fellowship, want to wish you a very, very happy Easter. Have a great day.